screen now? All right. Hello, John. So John Mittermeier is the director for the Search of Lost Birds at the American Bird Conservancy. We're very, very happy to be working with John and have him join us today. He's done a lot of field, field work on birds around the world, in, including the search for lost species in Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Madagascar, and Indonesia. And he's here to, to talk about the search for lost birds. And I first want to say thank you for coming. And um, I'd love to hear more about you, about you know what all you do for ABC and the Lost Birds Project and what got you into this. Yeah, thanks so much, Laura. Thanks, uh, Jessica. It's great. It's great to be here. And uh, it's so exciting also to see everybody chiming in from different parts of the world. It's really awesome to see, see where everybody's coming from. Um, so as you mentioned, I work at American Bird Conservancy, where my position is the director of the Search for Lost Birds. And I'll dive into a little bit of what that work entails as part of this talk. But uh, a lot of what we're trying to do is promote people to help find these birds that are currently lost and support projects uh, with local in-country partners around the world to do research on them and to learn more about them. Um, so that's a lot of what my day to day is, is trying to learn more about these species and connect with people who are interested in looking for them uh, and find different ways to support projects uh, on these species. Yeah, I imagine there's no shortage of people who want to be involved in these, and perhaps some of them are right in our audience. So thank you all for coming today to listen. And and John, if you want to just get started, that would be great. Yeah, sure. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. And I will stop my video and go mute. All right. So hopefully uh, everyone can see my presentation there. Um, so as I said a moment ago, my name is John Mittermeier, and I work at American Bird Conservancy, where my job is uh, working on the search for lost birds. And I'm really excited today to talk to everyone, to talk to you all, and tell you a little bit about this project that I've been working on with some colleagues, and also explain a little bit of why this project is so exciting and so interesting to me. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be able to get a sense of, of that excitement, and, uh, and hopefully it will have piqued a little bit of your interest as well. Um, so folks of the talk, I want to you know, have this be sort of fun seeing where people are chiming in from from all around the world and whether you're using your lunch hour or looking at this over morning coffee or a cup of tea in the evening or even perhaps late at night. I think I saw someone there from from Singapore. Uh, so the focus today is I want to sort of tell you two stories about two different bird species, a rail and a duck. And hopefully by telling those stories, it'll be interesting and it'll also give you a sense of of some of the excitement and potential of this project. But before we even get to that, we should zoom out a little bit and say, what am I talking about here? What do I mean when I say a lost species? There are a number of different ways that people might interpret that. And there are a number of different associations people might have with the word lost. For purposes of our project, we have a very specific definition for lost. This was published last year in an article in the journal Oryx. And essentially, a lost species is one that does not have any is not confirmed alive by photographic, audio, or genetic information in the last 10 or more years in the wild and has no ex situ population under human care. So what does this mean? Lost species are ones that we don't have independently verifiable of, indep independently verifiable documentation of in the last decade or more, and they're not yet considered extinct, um, and they also don't have captive populations. So one way of thinking about these species is they're sort of the most mysterious and unknown species out there, the ones that we think are still alive, but we're really not sure about, and we don't have any confirmed information to know whether they're definitely still there. Uh, so I sort of, you know, that definition alone sort of captures a bit of my interest and, and my imagination. So let's get into a couple of, of stories about these lost birds now that we have a sense of, of what they are. The first one I mentioned is about a duck. So this one's a species called the Madagascar pochard. Madagascar pochard is a species endemic to the island of Madagascar, an area where there's a, a lot of endemic birds. And at the beginning of the 20th century, it was relatively common in wetland habitats across north, uh, northern and eastern Madagascar. Starting in the 1930s and 1940s, a lot of wetland habitats started to get degraded um, around Madagascar and converted to rice and aquaculture. So you have areas that used to look like uh, freshwater ecosystems getting converted to habitats like this. And not long after that, the population of the Madagascar pochard crashed. Uh, the last few birds were seen in the wild in the 1960s. 
and the bird disappeared for 30 years up until 1991, when a single individual, uh, a single male, was caught in a fishing net in a place called La Cala Utra uh, in eastern Madagascar. That rediscovery launched a huge effort to try and find the pochard. You know, if there was one, maybe there could be more. Despite a big search, no other individuals were found, and this last a uh, single bird of the pochard died in captivity uh, not long after its capture. So, you know, for those of us who are interested in birds and, and have read a little bit about the history of conservation and ornithology, this might sound like a, a familiar story, you know, species declines, uh, goes extinct, and there's a sad individual that um, dies alone in, in a zoo. You know, this reminds us of, of perhaps Martha the passenger pigeon or uh, Benjamin, I think, was the name of the last thylacine, another uh, a sad individual going extinct. But there's a twist to this pochard story. So flash forward 15 years after this last individual uh, disappears in 1991, and a Malagasy ornithologist named Lily Arison and Renata Roland, working for the Peregrine Fund, is traveling around Madagascar doing surveys for a species of raptor called the Madagascar Harrier. I can give you a little bit of a sense of what it's like traveling around Madagascar, trying to find harrier populations, but uh, it's not easy. It's a, it's a difficult task to access different sites and travel Madagascar can be a real challenge. Uh, this is a, a national highway in Madagascar, one of the national highways in the rainy season. So it's a lot of work trying to get to these different areas. And as part of this process, Lily is reviewing old maps and he sees on, a, on an old historical map that there's an illustration of what looks like a wetland in a far-flung part of the uh, of northern part of Madagascar. He knows wetlands are good for harriers, and so he decides it might be worth checking this particular patch of wetland to see if there might be any harriers there. He starts to go to the area, driving up this valley, trying to reach the spot on the map where it looks like this wetland might be, and basically it looks like most of the habitat is gone, and this wetland that was once there, like many wetlands in Madagascar, may be no more. And just when they're about to turn around and give up on this spot, Lily notices a Madagascar Harrier flying over a distant ridge at the top of the valley. If there's a Harrier there, there must be a wetland. So they turn around, they push back up the valley, and they go way up to the top of this ridge, cross the ridge, and over the ridge, they see a wetland with a number of Madagascar, with a pair of Madagascar Harriers on it. And next to that wetland, there's a small lake, little uh, crater lake looking like this. And on that lake, more than 300 kilometers from where they were last seen are 16 Madagascar pochards. So there's a tiny little isolated population of this species that managed to persist, persist in this remote corner of the country. Um, this rediscovery launched a great conservation effort, including uh, community awareness and work by the Peregrine Fund. It led to the creation of not one, but two protected areas. That green arrow you can see is where, where the pochard lake was. And now that and many of the neighboring habitats are included in protected areas. And these protected areas uh, helped protect the area, not only for the pochard, but also for an incredible array, array of other rare and endemic species, such as chameleons, leaf chameleons, which are these incredible uh, endemic species to Madagascar, tiny primates, this is a mouse lemur, one of the smallest primate species in the world, as well as endemic birds, such as sunbird acetes, Madagascar grebes, that rare Madagascar red owl, and even one of the rarest raptors in the world, the Madagascar serpent eagle. In addition to that, there's this, this uh, rediscovery launched a captive breeding program. And thanks to all these conservation efforts, we can very, it's very exciting to say that from the 16 individuals found in 2006, there are now more than 100 Madagascar pochards alive today. And their future is looking much brighter than it was uh, a couple of decades ago. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Lily, uh, Lily Arison and, and his work on this, as well as the conservation projects for the Pochard, I'd encourage you to check out uh, some of the work by the Peregrine Fund, as well as the Durrell uh, Conservation Trust and Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, which are working on the, uh, the captive breeding programs. All right, so the second story I wanna tell you is about a rail. This rail is called the Makira Moorhen. And to learn about the Moorhen, we're gonna spin the globe from Madagascar and go to the Solomon Islands, and particularly an island called Makira, formerly known as San Cristobal, which is the easternmost of the Solomon Islands. You can see it circled there in yellow. Um, for those of you who are, are not as familiar with the area, this is 
east of New Guinea and sort of northeast of, of Australia. And it's worth telling a little bit of the story of how scientists discovered the, the Makira Morhen. So this old picture here is of a research, research scientist named Ernst Meyer, who is one of the best known uh, biologists and ornithologists of the 20th century, um, together with one of his research assist assistants in New Guinea. Meyer spent a lot of time looking at birds of paradise in New Guinea as a young biologist, as well as traveling to the Solomon Islands. And in the year, in December of 1929, he was in the forest in Makira, and a young boy brought an individual of this moorhen into camp. And there's a great anecdote from the people who were accompanying Mayer on this expedition. You can imagine Mayer as this very hardworking uh, German biologist who had spent months and months in the forests of New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. And when this particular bird came into camp, the colleagues who were with him noted that Dr. Mayer nearly fainted with excitement and had such a thrill he had to lay off work for the rest of the day because the thrill was too much for his constitution, which is otherwise quite sound. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context of you know, from a uh, an ornithological perspective, this rail, which was one of the only at the time was described as a new genus. It's very unlike other species of rails in the region. It's a flightless rail that's endemic to this one island. And really, you know, a, as Mayer's response, I think, encapsulates was is a pretty extraordinary species. I developed a personal interest in this species as well. As a young kid, I happened to be flipping through a book called Threatened Birds of the World. I don't know, as a, as a young birder, you know, I don't know if any of you have similar experiences where, you know, as you start to get interested in birds, you were just fascinated by books and, and wanted to leaf through as many bird field guides as you possibly could. Well, in the process of doing that, I came across uh, this illustration and this description of the moorhen, which, you know, I've cut out a little bit of it here. But the thing that really stood out to me was if you look range, question mark, population, question mark. And the whole distribution map, I think, is as when we're looking at these bird guides, we're often used to seeing detailed distributions of where birds occur. And I remember first seeing this and just it kind of blowing my mind that a distribution could be a question mark. And that in uh that seemed just captivating and kind of intriguing. How is it possible that a bird species might be, might not really know exactly where it is? At the time that I saw this, uh, that Threatened Birds of the World was published is in around 2000. Um, and at the time that I first saw it, the Makira moorhen was already considered critically endangered. You know, so no, there had been no scientific records of the species since Mayer saw that specimen in, in 1929. But it's worth noting that for a long period of time, the assumption was that, well, you know, we might not have any updated records of this bird, but, you know, it lives on a, on a, what, a, a, what looks like a well-forested island in an area where there might not be that many threats. And the assumption, you know, this is a nice quote from 1975 saying that, look, the, the moorhen's probably in little danger of extinction since these uh, it lives in this these particularly inaccessible forests. Of course, flash forward to uh, the 2000s and with still no records that, uh, that has been revised to think that, well, th this species could well be under threat. So, over the course of two uh, different expeditions, one in 2015, 2016, and then again for a follow-up in 2023 um, as part of the Search for Lost Birds, we collaborated with Dr. Al Uwe, who you see here, he's uh, all the way on the my left of the screen, um, and he's at the University of Rochester, as well as John and Joyce Murray on the, on the island of Makira, who are based in Kirakira um, and are interested in conservation around the island and with support from a number of different organizations, uh, including the Bird Conservation Fund, National Geographic, University of Oxford, Zoological Society of London, and Mohammed bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund. We did two projects to try and see if we could find this bird. You know, it's just kind of what, what do you, what, what should we think as conservationists about a species like the moorhen? You know, it's this question mark on the map. Is it critically endangered? Uh, or is maybe, or is maybe it's still there, but, um, just nobody's nobody's gone to check on it. So our mission was to try and answer that question. So we traveled to Makira. And one of the things that's really significant about trying to do any field work around Makira, and it's true in many parts of the world, is that the local people who live there 
have an incredible knowledge of the land, have an incredible knowledge of the biodiversity, and are really some of the best placed to uh, to know about the particular species there. Um, so this is a, a hand-drawn map of some of the forest in Makira that shows just you know this incredibly detailed knowledge of the land and the different tributaries. And one of the amazing things we encountered on Makira is you start talking to people and that easily be able to often be able to name 50 uh, to 60 percent of all the native birds by have a local name for them and just be able to rattle them off by memory. So if you compare that to many different other parts of the world, you know, perhaps uh, people in many places around the U.S., you know, if you went and sort of stopped by, talked to anyone you might run into um, and ask them what they knew about local birds, that seems to be a big contrast from Makira, where there is this still this real connection to the land and a lot of knowledge of species. So people would know birds like this uh, Makira dwarf kingfisher, Susue is the local name for it, or Makira flycatcher, which is sometimes called Kwede Kwede Marata. So being aware of this incredible local knowledge on Makira, the focus of our project was both to look for this Makira moorhen in the forest, but more importantly, to try and talk to as many people around the island to see what they might know about the species and to see if they'd had any recent sightings of it, or if they might know where to find it or what might've happened to it. Over the course of these different projects, uh, we did more than 80 interviews in 33 communities around the island of Makira, more than a thousand camera trap days uh, in various different parts of the forest, and more than three months, more than a hundred days, just doing field surveys in different parts of the island. And you can see here, uh, a map of the different areas that were visited as part of these projects to look for the Makira moorhen. This one, that one circle in the middle in 2006 was part of an ornithological survey done by the University of Copenhagen. On the right there in 2015 is some research that BirdLife International did in northeastern Makira looking for the moorhen. And then all those little red dots and yellow stars and triangles are places that we went in 2015, 2016 to either do interviews or set camera traps to look for the bird. And then we revisited many of those same locations in 2023, as well as doing surveys in this far western part of the island, uh, which you can see there in that circled 2023. What did we find? Well, we found a lot of people who could tell us about the moorhen. The local name of the moorhen is Kia, and we encountered quite a lot of people who knew it. Many people were familiar with it. And there are people such as Cosmos Puaquero here, who's a chief in the village of Queriapena, who could tell us accounts of how they'd seen the bird. You know, so Cosmos recounted seeing the uh, Makira moorhen in the 1950s at exactly this spot where he is photographed, seeing the bird run across the trail in the forest. We also encountered a lot of local knowledge of this species. Uh, so, you know, people, it's the Kia uh, figures in sort of uh, fits into figures of speech. So there's some things, a uh, way of describing a house as a Kia-like house if it's shaped a certain way. There's also nursery rhymes and stories about a Kia. In one village, we encountered a dance to, that's sort of meant to entertain kids about the Kia, which you can see a picture of here. In addition to all this knowledge, we also encountered a lot of threats. So uh, cats, feral cats were common on the camera traps. Invasive cane toads were widespread. There was lots of signs of uh, feral dogs in some areas, as well as increased hunting, you know, things that could be significant threats to a flightless bird uh, like the Makira moorhen. And we also found really widespread evidence of logging uh, with native old growth forests along the coast being converted from areas like this to scenes like this. And perhaps not directly related to the moorhen, but it's worth noting that these logging efforts also have a big impact on other aspects of the environment and people's livelihood. And they convert uh, waterways, you know, which in forested areas can be clean and clear and provide uh, you know, valuable sources of fresh water for people. Those will get totally sediment filled as a result of the logging. Um, and this even impacts inshore marine habitats. Again, probably not directly related to the moorhen, but this is what a uh, an inshore marine habitat on Makira looks like in an unlogged area as opposed to a logged area. So we did not find a moorhen despite all of these efforts. And what comes of that might be, you know, is this, what's the conclusion here is that this bird is maybe, perhaps there's enough evidence to include that it's not critically endangered at this point, 
but it's extinct and we're too late to find this bird and protect it. So is that sort of all that's come of all this work and this effort and this searching, just the conclusion that there's no, no more hen there anymore? Well, not quite. One of the things that we realized as part of this project and part of these expeditions is this effort of looking for the Makira moorhen ended up being a prompt to have discussions with people all around the island, to have discussions about conservation um, and about the state of the species and biodiversity on the island and create connections with communities and get to hear what they were thinking about, about the state of the habitat and, uh, and what was happening there. And one of the incredible things that came of this is that all these connections and all these conversations ended up helping to spark the creation of a community protected area in Eastern Makira. Um, so there are a number of leaders, community leaders, including Cosmos Puakero, who I mentioned in the slide before, uh, who following this work and, and due to this work, decided to put their lands together to create a large community protected area, um, which they're on the verge of gazetting and should hopefully be able to gazette in the, and have it be officially designated in the, uh, in the next few months. And when declared, this protected area will be the only the second ever protected area in the Solomon Islands and the largest by an order of magnitude. It will be home to all of the remain all of the extant endemic birds uh, that we definitely know are there, as well as many other endemic species on this on the island of Makira. So, why lost birds? Hopefully, these two stories that I've told can give you a little bit of a a sense of the, the excitement and the interest around these species and, you know, can tell us sort of get into this question of why, why we're interested in focusing on them. So specifically, you know, why these species? Uh, well, we think of the pochard, lost species can be rediscovered and come back. Even if a species has not, uh, has not been seen in a long period of time, there's still a chance that it could be out there. Um, and updated on the information on these species is really vital. So if we're thinking about our goals of, as conservationists and what we really want to achieve um, is to help prevent extinctions as much as possible, but also to understand patterns of extinction um, and understand what's happening as another priority. Digging into these lost species and trying to, to find them and learn more about them can be really important. Another significant aspect of lost species is that, you know, these stories can be compelling. I, I, I hope I've been able to, compel, uh, to convey a little bit of that, telling you about the moorhen and the pochard. Um, but I think there's something really captivating about these species for many people, as, as I described in terms of seeing that illustration in Threatened Birds of the World. You know, lost species are really, in a way, what launched me into a career in, in conservation um, and a career in ornithology. Just that idea of, of the mystery and the excitement about being like, how is how can how can there be a question mark species out there? Um, and so, you know, again, thinking of what we're trying to accomplish in conservation and what are our priorities, leaning into these compelling stories can be can be really important. You know, trying to generate public interest and support can be one of the key things uh, that we're trying to achieve as conservationists. You know, I think if we want to be successful in our in our bird conservation efforts. We need to have people be aware and, and interested in what we're doing. And I've, I've switched up the birds and added a little one to the corner here. This is another a good example of how uh, the, uh, the potential of these species to really, uh, to really generate public interest. This bird is the black-naped pheasant pigeon. Similar to uh, the moorhen and the pochard, this is a bird that had been unrecorded by scientists for a long period of time. The last scientific records of the black nape pheasant pigeon um, up until last year were from 1896. We supported the project in, in September of last year to look for this species. After a, a month of searching in the forest, we managed to get camera trap photos of it here. These are some of the first ever photographs of the black nape pheasant pigeon. And in addition to the scientific outputs of finding this species and being able to answer the question of whether or not it's uh, whether or not it's still there, whether or not it still survives, one of the incredible things about this project was the amount of attention and excitement and interest that it generated. So when we shared this story, it got a huge amount of attention, um, both from venues that might be more typically interested in conservation, such as Audubon magazine 
as well as ones that were a little bit uh, a little bit more unexpected and perhaps unusual for conservation stories. For example, People Magazine, I put I put a clip of there. Um, so all told, you know, this media about the rediscovery of the black nate pheasant pigeon received coverage in more than 40 countries that we know about and had a total potential audience of hundreds of millions of people. So, of course, this attention is only really valuable for conservation if you can then translate it into action and into efforts to actually conserve and protect species. But at the same time, you know, it's this just sort of getting people's interest can be a really important first step here. And I think lost species and these searches and these rediscoveries can provide an opportunity to, to do that. Finally, I think a really important thing about lost birds is the way that is sort of thinking of them as flagships for bigger knowledge gaps, right? You think like what's kind of the most extreme example of a knowledge gap is a species that nobody's definitely recorded in 10 or more years. And so these are kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, the, the least known things, the most extreme examples, but they can be representative of all these other knowledge gaps that we have, you know, maybe species that have unknown nesting behavior, unknown diets, unknown migration patterns, unknown threats, things like that. And all of these can be really significant for, uh, for conservation. You know, if we want to know where birds are, what their populations are, and how to protect them, all these little bits of, uh, of data and information about the species are, are really valuable and important to have. And so lost species can kind of be the, the representatives of these knowledge gaps that are important to it for us to address. So I hope this introduction, these couple of stories have given you a little bit of background on lost birds. And with that, it sort of introduces to you uh, the value of, of them and the interest in them. Building on that, we started in 2021, a partnership called the Search for Lost Birds. Uh, to try and address this and, and lean into the conservation value of these species. This is a partnership between American Bird Conservancy, BirdLife International, and Rewild. And it's part of Rewild's bigger Search for Lost Species program. So they're also looking for lost species in other taxonomic groups, such as amphibians, sharks, uh, mammals, et cetera. And, um, you should check out their, their website, which details a little bit more of that. Together with this presentation, we're also really excited to be starting a collaboration around lost birds with birds of the world. Um, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, I think this, you know, we're, we're a number of reasons we're really excited about that, but one of those is this idea of these data gaps. You know, and I think birds of the world has a tremendous, obviously a tremendous resource for information about bird species around the world and to be able to collaborate them to both learn more about, collaborate with them to both, to learn more both about lost birds but also help fill in data gaps, relevant data gaps about other species is something that we're really interested in and excited about and, and looking forward to. So, you know, what are, what are we doing specifically uh, as our work for the search for lost birds? So we have kind of three main things that, that we're focused on. As I mentioned there, this kind of ends up being a lot of my day to day and, and the day to day of other people working on the search for lost birds team. The first of those is determining which birds are lost, you know, which, which, how many species are there that meet this criteria that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk? How many species are there that we don't have definite records of in 10 or more years? Um, where are they? Uh, we also really want to support conservation projects for these species in collaboration with local partners. That's something that's really significant with, for us is trying to do searches for these species, but make sure that those searches are done with local in-country partners and with people who are really well suited to do the conservation if the species is found or to support conservation efforts, even if the species is not found, you know, as that example shows from the Solomon Islands. And then finally, we wanna sort of share news and stories about these lost birds to hopefully get people interested in what's happening, uh, get people excited, and also where relevant to use these species as a way to convey some of what's, what's happening to birds around the planet um, and to convey the, the state of biodiversity. I, I mean, I think many of us will be well aware that sadly, uh, you know, we're in an extinction crisis. A lot of bird populations are declining. A lot of birds are declining. And some searches for lost birds are gonna result in species not being found, you know, perhaps like the moorhen. Um, and these stories are actually really significant ones, I think for us to tell and share as well. So I won't get into it too much here, but I think maybe a question that's on many people's minds now is wondering, 
you know, which, which birds are lost. I mentioned a couple of them today, but how many birds are there out there that are lost? Where are they? Um, what do they look like? Is it possible? Are there any that you can uh, go look for or help go look for? So over the last year, we conducted a global review of citizen science data uh, cross-referenced with input from a lot of different experts around the world to try and determine which birds meet this criteria of no documented records in the last decade or more. And if you're interested in digging into some of the methods behind this and learning a little bit more about this process and, and what it took to figure out which birds are lost, I'd really encourage you to uh, watch this recent presentation done by my colleague Cameron Rutt here at ABC using citizen science to identify lost birds. He did this presentation uh, for the IUCN um, as part of the Reverse the Red uh, IUCN Lost Species Month. And I think we can share a link to this talk uh, either after, either in the chat now or afterwards. And you know that's a great, a great place to start to learn more about some of the, the process of figuring out which birds were lost. For now, I'll give you the quick summary, which is to say that we came up with a list of 130 species around the world that are lost that have no documentation in the last decade. For me, I don't know what, you, what, I'll be curious to hear what other people think, whether 130 sounds like a lot or a little. To me, this is, uh, it didn't sound like much. You know, it's 1.1% about, depending on which taxonomy you use of the global species total. Um, and 130, you know, eh, it's quite a few, but it's also doesn't feel like an, an intractable number of species. I was actually very impressed to see just how uh, comprehensive the global ornithological coverage has become and how many species you know, despite being incredibly hard to find and incredibly rare, have good recent documentation. Where are these birds, these lost birds located? Well, they're sort of spread all over the world and almost every continent has at least a few lost bird species. Um, if you visit our website, searchforlostbirds.org, which I'll, I'll sh uh, show that link again, um, there's a map where you can explore and see exactly where, where these species are uh, and dig into them a little bit more. For now, I'll point out that like, while they are globally located, we also very clearly have a few geographic hotspots where there are large numbers of lost birds. Um, most notably, this is the, uh, the Rift Valley of Central Africa, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, there's a lot of lost birds there, as well as the islands of Melanesia, you know, similar to where we saw that map before of the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea and its outlying islands have a lot of lost, lost bird species. mention this, if you want to dig into this list a little bit more, um, you should check out our website, which we're still finalizing, but uh, it'll, it'll allow you an opportunity to explore the map and see where these lost birds are, as well as this list of species, and provide a bit of uh, information there if you're curious and looking at some particular species of birds. So to kind of just wrap things up then a little bit and thinking about like, all right, so we have this list of 130 birds around the world. Uh, we have a sense of what these projects entail. We have a sense of what their outcomes can be. You know, they can lead to exciting rediscoveries like a pochard or perhaps not a rediscovery, but some valuable information about the status of a species together with corollary conservation benefits, as is the case with the, uh, with the Makira moorhen. Um, so, you know, what's the goal? What's the aim for these, for these lost birds and, and these 130 species looking ahead? Well, I took this screenshot uh, this morning, just of the eBird homepage. And I think this is just a great demonstration of the incredible power of the global birding community. So we think about even just all of us around the world who are right here now on this talk. And, and the, uh, you know, you look at some of these numbers, 85 million complete checklists in eBird from over 900,000 people around the world. And this is just eBird. Obviously not everybody uses eBird. There's a lot of other citizen science platforms out there that people contribute data to. And then there are thousands, if not millions of people who are also very interested in keen ornithologists and bird watchers who are not using eBird. So if we kind of imagine the potential of this global community out there and what our capacity is, shouldn't we be able to search for all the lost birds and sort of think of this. And I think that's something that we're really excited about and something that we're thinking of here is can we put this out as a uh, you know, sort of a global a global challenge and a global call to action to our to our community to see if we can find you know there shouldn't seems like there shouldn't be any species out there that we don't have documentation of in the last ten or more years or that we don't know 
what their status is exactly. So I'll sort of leave you with that as, a, as an intriguing question to ponder. Is that something that you know is possible? Um, obviously, some of these beasts are very difficult to find, but I think it, it seems like, a, like an intriguing and exciting challenge. I like to specifically mention the Search for Lost Birds team here. As I mentioned, it's a partnership between BirdLife, Rewild, and American Bird Conservancy. Roger Safford is the lead for the Lost Birds program at BirdLife. At Rewild, it's uh, Christina Biggs. Devin Murphy uh, leads our um, communications around lost bird species. And at ABC, Cameron Rutt is working very closely with me there. And as, as I mentioned, he, uh, he's been working on figuring out which birds are lost and, and definitely take a look at his talk um, about using citizen science to identify lost bird species. So with that, I'll say uh, thank you so much for, for listening. I hope I've uh, conveyed a bit of the excitement around, around lost birds and given you a bit of a sense of what we're trying to do here. And I can, so we got some time for questions. So really happy to answer any questions that people have um, and chat a bit more about, uh, about lost birds with you all. Thank you so much. This was just a wonderful talk. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. Um, so I, in my opinion, I think 30, 130 species is doable, right? I feel that energy around this as well. Um, I'm wondering, you know, two things. Where does the funding come from for these expeditions? And how can people be involved with the specific expeditions? But also, um, as a corollary of that, how can people who live nearby or perhaps travel to these places try to make a difference too? Is there a way? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the uh, the funding one. I think this is another thing that's really important to mention about lost birds is that you know these species can be difficult to find, but often these are not very complicated or complex projects. And so they're actually, they can be a great return on investment from a conservation funding perspective. Um, you know, a lot of these projects, particularly when they're focused on working with local partners, you know, you can get a lot of value out of them. So some of our projects that we've done, uh, mostly what we do is we offer grants between five and $10,000 to in-country partners to look for lost birds. Um, you know, it's a great example. We did a project for a species called the Dusky Tetraca. That was about a $7,000 project, ended up rediscovering the species, um, which was an incredible success. So, you know, a great way to get involved is to help help support uh help support projects help support projects with local local partners um and as i said you know those are not they can often be a relatively low uh low investment in the grand scheme of things um in terms of opportunities to get involved you know i think there are a number of different ways i think we want to have people you know i mentioned citizen science is one of the backbones for the information that we've been using to assess which birds are lost so just contributing to citizen science in any way is helping this project. You know, I've mentioned that kind of iceberg of, of unknown data. You know, I think there's a lot of different levels and ways to help out. And even if you're not in an area where a, a lost bird might be, trying to learn a little bit more about the distribution of species in your area can be a huge benefit um, or, you know, other behavioral things. Um, in terms of directly looking for these lost species, I think the best way is to try and find opportunities to support and partner with in-country conservation organizations and ornithologists, right? Because I think we really want to find these birds, but we want to make sure that finding them is linked to conserving them so that they don't just get seen once and then become lost again. And so we want to do everything we can to try and make sure that any searches and projects are connected to future conservation efforts. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, uh, maybe a time to focus too, or remind people that it's, it's documented evidence, you know, more than just a sighting, you know, uh, one or two individuals, it's, it's either photographs or sound recordings. And I think you said one more thing. Um, so yeah, if you happen to be in the company of any of these, please do uh, document it if you can. Yeah, great point there. I'll just, the last one was a uh, genetic material. I think you know, it's probably less relevant for birds than some other groups, but you know, mm -hmm. we've done some environmental DNA or, uh, you know, sometimes birds are known from blood samples, things like that. But media mm -hmm. is super valuable from a scientific perspective. So any interested people out there, take pictures, take sound recordings, contribute those, share those. Those are really important. Right. Photos of nests, but obviously don't disturb a bird when it's on its nest. But, but if you happen to see one isolated, not when no birds are on it, that would be a good, good time. Okay. Um, 
So I love this uh, concept of the, you know, it being a flagship for other knowledge gaps uh, for that habitat and other species that are in that habitat. And I just wondered um, to what degree do you guys collect data um, for other species while you're there? Is it more like eBird information or is there any organized method that you use to uh, gather information on these other So species? that's something we're really interested in exploring and developing and figuring out the best approaches to do that. Cause it's a little bit, you know, on the one hand, you want to make sure your focus is on the particular learning the most possible about the lost bird. And if you try and add too many things, right. you might lose track of that. But on the other hand, you know, as you just said, there, often going to these areas to look for a species brings you to sites where there's a lot of other information gaps. Um, we recently did a project this September piloting the opportunity to, in Madagascar, piloting the opportunity to partner with a bunch of different taxonomic specialists mm -hmm. across a range of different lost species. So trying to say, all right, we're going to visit this site. We're going to try and learn more information about a lost bird, the dusky tetraca, uh, a species from Madagascar, as well as try and find some lost species in other taxonomic groups. Mm -hmm. um, and there should be some news coming about that fairly soon. So I won't say too much now, but I think we're really excited about the potential to do that for birds as well as other species in the, in the future. And we're excited to work with you too, because, you know, Birds of the World is a participatory platform that people, um, you know, large numbers of people contribute information about birds, you know, about diet and habitat and behavior and breeding. Um, and, and, you know, we can't just, uh, people at Cornell can't be the ones to uh, um, basically, um, we can't fill up every species. We can't keep it 100% updated all the time. So we really depend on relationships like with you and with authors around the world, with other nonprofits and conservation organizations to help us gather this material. So I'm glad that we've we've decided to work together like this. And I look forward to, to learning more and help us keep updated on these 130 species and whatever other species we learn about along the way. Um, so yeah, fascinating stories here. Let me get into some of these questions. I'm glad you showed us the map of the distribution of lost birds. Um, somebody had asked, um, the distribution seems to be heavily weighted towards the south. Um, is that true? Is, or is it more equatorial through the tropics? Uh, how would you describe that? Yeah, so it obviously, you know, it's correlated to areas where you have uh, a lot of restricted endemism of species often. You know, you think it's in many ways, it can be easier to become lost if, if a species is only found uh, in a small geographic area. So that leads to more species in the tropics. But then I think one of the most important patterns around lost birds is that there tend to be more lost birds in areas where there's less citizen science coverage. So this kind of comes into this call to action and these things to do is that where there's, you know, citizen scientists find birds, they find other species. Um, and so places where there's more robust communities, there tend to be there's more information about species, there's more knowledge, there's fewer lost birds. Um, so there's often more lost bird species in areas where we have fewer people contributing citizen science data. And I think that means that one of our aims for this project is try and encourage and promote those communities uh, okay. so that they can help us find those species. That's a really great point. Okay, so somebody asked about the discovery of the black nape, fe black nape pheasant pigeon. Um, I read that the area found is scheduled for logging and the owner is moving forward with it. What does this mean for the recently discovered species? So exactly. So we we had a part of that story. We went there, we learned talking to the landowners that the area had been scheduled for logging. I mentioned the impacts of logging in the context of Makira. It can be absolutely devastating for uh, native biodiversity. Um, I think in the case of the pheasant pigeon, the priority is really to learn a little bit more. You know, we found, spent a month out there. We got a couple of pictures of the bird. We know that it's in at least two sites that are connected and quite close together, but we still don't have a great sense of how widespread it is at all. And so I think mm -hmm. we really, you know, one of the priorities there and, and some folks from Cornell uh, who are involved in this project, Jordan Borsma and Jason Gregg, who is also, you know, one of the leads on the, on the project. I know they're planning to go back soon and start to address this question directly. But we want to, you know, know a little bit more about the species and where it is. And of course, we want to, you know, prevent logging as much as possible because we know it has bad effects for biodiversity. But we also, I think, have to be conscious of how we can do that in ways that we're offering good mm -hmm. alternatives for yeah. local people who are 
looking for income or looking for ways to support themselves. And so if we want to sort of say no to logging, we have to come up with good alternatives to, to make that possible. And it all comes down to working with the local communities who are the drivers of that economy and have more local influence. So yeah, it's it's really important to to you know this is a this is a collaboration across countries in order to make have the influence that we need at the government level to control that. Um, yeah, just I'll just add to that quickly. It, one of the things most exciting about that protector I mentioned on Makira and the Solomons is that. Uh, you know, that protected area is designed with carbon credits in mind. So, you know, loggers come in, they provide income in communities that's really short term. It's kind of, it's basically, it's pretty predatory, to be honest. They, you know, give a little bit of cash and then they just destroy the land and leave. Um, and so one of the great exciting things about this community protected area is that it's providing 30 years of income to the communities through carbon credits. So it's going to be a sustainable long-term benefit to the people living around the area, um, which is incredible, really exciting. That's fantastic. Environmental economics working there. Um, let's see. Somebody would like the full Greenway citation, Greenway 1973. So maybe that person can connect with us later and we'll 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 um, be able to connect you with that. Um, would birds such as, I don't know how to say this, Nechisar nightjar and red sea swallow count? Or is one of the qualifications of loss that the bird has to be seen previously? But that's a good question. Both of those birds count. So it don't doesn't have to be seen previously. Um, it has to be considered a species according to either the eBird, so that's the Clements taxonomy or the bird life taxonomy. I think in mm -hmm. the case of the swallow and the nightjar, those are considered species by both. Um, and so if it's considered a species and it's not considered extinct according to the IUCN red list, and it has not been documented in 10 or more years, it's a lost bird. So those are good, good species to mention and both intriguing, intriguing ones. Um, that would be really interesting to learn a little bit, a little bit more about. Yeah. Um, any opinion on the mustache kingfisher? Uh, mustache kingfisher. Yes. I think it's a, an incredible bird and I, and I would love to, uh, yeah, I, I'd love for someone to find it and get some, get some documentation of it. Um, you know, I know, I think Whoever's asking that question probably knows well that there's a, a population on Guadalcanal and then also one on Bougainville, which were recently considered different species, uh, may or may not be getting lumped at some point. But regardless, uh, you know, I think the birds on Bougainville, well, we know they're on Guadalcanal. The Bougainville birds have not been recorded in quite a long time, but are very likely still mm -hmm. there. And uh, and hopefully someone can go and, and find them soon. Yeah. Um, what is the status of the ivory build? And a related question, have you done any work on the Imperial Woodpecker uh, dish ivory build woodpecker complex? So status of the ivory bill, I think the ivory bill is an interesting one because when people think of lost birds, it immediately springs to mind. I mean, it's just such a well-known species and, and people know so much about it. Um, so from our side, we're not trying to weigh in on whether or not the ivory build is extant or extinct. You know, we have a lot of different authorities that are doing that job. And you know, we rely on the, the IUCN red list to determine whether or not species are extinct. But one of the things that I think is really noteworthy about the ivory build that makes it a great example for these lost birds is just how much attention and how much attention it's been able to, to capture. You know, it's a bird that somehow just keeps getting more and more attention. You know, these books written about it and the way it just captures our imagination um, and draws us in. And I think in that sense, it's a really good example of the communications and interest value of these uh, of these lost bird species. Mm -hmm. We've not done any work specifically on the ivory bill or the imperial woodpecker. As I said, you know, a, a lot of what we're looking for is local partners in places. If there are any local partners uh, in Mexico who are particularly interested in searching for the imperial, mm -hmm. drop, it, drop us an email. Um, I think also what we're looking for is ways where we can add the most value beyond what's already being done. And so species that are, you know, that aren't receiving as much attention. And if we can uh, turn a little bit of attention to those, you know, I think there are a lot of people who are really excited about ivory pill already and, uh, and looking for it hard. So, you know, yeah. there, it seems to be getting a lot of attention as is. Right. And just an update on that for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service made a determination just recently that the ivory billed woodpecker is not officially extinct yet, according to the U.S. FWS. So um, there is still some hope out there for some people. And um, so that the mystery lives on. 
Uh, okay, are there any prospective rediscovery plans regarding the Jordan's Courser? Got some specific questions here. I hope that's okay with you. No, that's that's great. I think uh, you know we've we've been in touch with some folks in India who are interested in looking for the cursor, um, who are excited about it. I think it sounds like that's not a species that I know particularly well, but it sounds like there's some intriguing possibilities to look for it. Um, and we're hoping to be able to support some projects on it in the coming year. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm really excited to see what comes of those. I think it uh, I think it'll yeah. be great. How many projects can you do at once? It seems like you've got, you know, the irons in a lot of fires. Dep depends on the capacity. Uh, you know, I think it's, it depends on just sort of funding um, and number of people who we, we have, uh, who we have sort of helping out to, to manage and run the projects. Um, mm -hmm. But so as got, I, yeah, I mean, as yeah. I sort of said, I think ideal would be let's, let's try and find all these birds. You know, it seems like it doesn't, it's not that big a number. And so if we can just get a, you know, if, if we have the the funding and, and the support to be able to, to do it, yeah. you know, why not? Let's make it, let's do 130 let's do projects. <laughs> if somebody that would be the dream. Organize people, right. You got to organize yeah. people, find the funding, just tie, tie it together. And that's what, that's, what's great about an initiative, set a goal, figure out what it takes to get there. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, some someone asked about a determination of making them extinct. I just want to repeat what John said. Um, this group is not involved in making that determination. That's really just a government and an IUCN determination. A lot of factors go into it, and um, probably not 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 great for us to discuss today. It's quite different for each species. Um, all right, this has probably been asked, but how can someone help who isn't traveling much? Besides, you know, we did talk about how people can donate funds to help to help make this happen. They can follow you uh, on the website. Maybe do you have a specific newsletter for this? Or is mostly through the ABC newsletter that they would follow it? Yeah, we're we're working on developing a newsletter. So stay tuned. That should be coming soon. But I, I think, you know, a couple of ways love people to just sort of stay engaged, stay interested in what's going on, uh, keep track, keep track of different projects, mm -hmm. um, and be involved that way. If someone wants to support the project a and support some of the searches, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I think another, another sort of couple aspects there is, you know, we're working on building into the website, a collaborative editing component to it. So even if someone doesn't travel that much, but they're interested in doing a little bit of research about lost birds and, and helping aggregate, data so that we can have the website be kind of the first first stop for anybody who wants to learn about these species and try and work on a project or plan a project to look for them. Um, you know, so that can be super helpful for doing some of that background info. And then also, I think, you know, the sort of bigger picture of thinking about citizen science and all of us collaborating on these data gaps and these knowledge gaps, even if you don't travel that much, you know, there may be some, some mysteries and some question marks for the birds in your area and, uh, and thinking about ways to, to try and solve those or, or help contribute to them would be another, another way to, to be part of this. So over time, you'll be developing this volunteer program, volunteer researchers who can maybe adopt a species and, and help you gather whatever's available. That's fantastic. That sounds fun. All righty. So here's a question. Um, a monocular biologist writes in, and and they specialize in wildlife ecology and conservation. Wondering how molecular tools might aid the search for lost birds, like DNA. Good question. I think so. Two things immediately uh, stand out there. One is you know something I think I, I mentioned briefly before, but kind of trial molecular tools as a way to search for species. So mm -hmm. we haven't done this much with birds yet, but you could, you know, for some other species, you can use environmental DNA as a way to figure out which species are in the area. I think potentially this could work for birds. So that would be a really interesting approach where essentially you go in, test the water and uh, try and see which species, you know, based on genetic material, which species are in the area. Could mm -hmm. you rediscover a lost bird that way? If so, it'd be, it would be super cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then another way that molecular tools can really help is in terms of understanding the taxonomic uh, status of some of these species. You know, someone mentioned Nechisar nightjar before. That's a bird only known from a single wing. 
So being able to sequence some of these specimens that are really poorly known where there's not a lot of information about them can be super helpful, both to know for sure, like, is this actually a species? And mm -hmm. if it is, what is it related to? And maybe that information about what it's related to can help guide efforts to, to look for it and to learn more about it. So, so there's some research projects for, you know, for grad students in, in college, right? That's Absolutely. Awesome. Those are some, those are some perfect research projects right there. Nice. Good. Um, yeah. Somebody mentioned the idea of, of having volunteers look at camera trap photos, which is a very time consuming process, you know, so that sounds good. Uh, okay. Um, I wanted to know if you're using automated recorders in these expeditions. We are a little bit. So that's one that uh, we used a bit as part of the pheasant pigeon project. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a super interesting frontier to explore. You know, thinking about some of these new technological tools and ways that we can we can help fill these these knowledge gaps, whether it's environmental DNA or or ARUs. I think the ARU approach would be really interesting and really promising. Um, one of the challenges is you don't have sound, you don't know the vocalizations of quite a few of these lost birds. So mm -hmm. you then have to think about how are you detecting an absence or how are you detecting a novel sound as opposed to being able to just search through your data set for, for a known vocalization. So there might be some technical challenges there, but I think that'll be a really intriguing thing to, mm -hmm. to develop um, around some of these searches. Yeah, I could at least, I could at least identify the presence of an unknown sound that could, you know, pattern and timing that could lead to an expedition to go look for it. Yeah. Somebody asked you how important are local governments and NGOs in the search, but I think we've kind of defined that, that they're essential, <laughs> absolutely essential in a lot of ways, right? For partnering with them for the expedition, for permission, for guidance, for local indigenous knowledge, all the way up to trying to get regulations, um, you know, modifications and regulations, so. Yeah, I absolutely. Should. And I think we can't, uh, we can't really underscore that enough, just ab absolutely vital. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned it in terms of the Moorhen project, you know, that was really relying on local knowledge. You know, people on Makira were the ones who knew the bird the best, they knew where to find it. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones who drove the the decision to come up with a protected area. Um, and so, you know, it's really all about these local, local collaborations, working with in-country NGOs, working with people who, who know the area, who are well-suited to look for these species and who can support conservation um, going forward. Are there any travel plans for 2024? Any expeditions well, planned? We hinted at a couple of projects. Uh, I think, you know, Jaredon's cursor might be one. We're, we're excited um, about some potential projects, but uh, stay tuned and, and check in check in on the website. I think we have a, a whole list of things we're really excited about doing. Um, and some potential partners interested in working on these species. And yeah, and hopefully there should be should be some more lost bird projects coming in, in the near future. Great. Okay, so um, I think it's one, 102, so we probably ought to wrap up. Is there any final final message to the people out here who've, who've tuned in and are really thrilled about this concept? No, I think just a huge, a huge thank you for everyone for joining and, and uh, been a lot of fun sharing a little bit of this and hope I've been able to convey some of the some of the excitement and, and why I find it so interesting and uh yeah hope people enjoy the rest of their day wherever they are around the world all right well thank you for doing this great project John I really appreciate your time today but also just that you're out there looking for these and keep us informed I'm glad we're working together and trying to get some of the information that you learn into birds of the world and um let me know what we can do to support you too absolutely thanks all so right. much Laura Sure. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we're going to close up in a second here, but thank you for uh, joining us. And we'll see you next month for the taxonomy update seminar. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>